Hello, everyone. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Jay Schubrook. I'm a physician and diabetologist at Torah University of California. Um, I want to welcome you either back or to Zoom into Wellness. We are so happy that you're here. Um, we have been looking for ways to, to connect with our community. We know that we are living in unprecedented times. We have had many things that we have been uh, challenged with this year. There are many things that we've been working on and we feel it's more important than ever for us to find ways to connect, know that you're not alone and know that you can be healthy despite all the challenges that we're, exp we're experiencing. Tonight, I'm delighted to have a panel of speakers that are gonna be working with you and presenting and, and interacting with you about diabetes and or preventing complications in general and that it's never too late to take action. Um, you know, I think often my experience has been that people feel like they get bad news and we automatically go to the, to the very worst case scenario. And I think that this is time for us to really share not only people's individual experiences, but really good evidence that there's a lot we can do to stay healthy. And tonight you're gonna hear a lot about that. Uh, I wanna introduce Shalaya Yazdi, who is, uh, has a master's in public health and she's in the master's of medical sciences. And for many of you, you know her already as she has been the main coordinator of the Zoom into Wellness today, but she's changing roles to be a presenter tonight. I'm also happy to introduce Dr. Daya, Dia Manavalan, uh, PharmD, and Dr. Clipper Young, PharmD, who are um, faculty at Toro University and are very active in some innovative uh, prevention programs in the community, and they're going to share them with you. And then finally, I'm also happy to introduce Melody Wang, who is in the med medical, excuse me, the Masters of Medical Sciences program, and will serve as our moderator tonight. Um, with this in mind, I think that we have a lot to talk about, and I want to uh, welcome you to Zoom into Wellness with our panel, talking about prevention. I'll turn it over to Shalaya. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shubrook. I'm passionate about create, contributing to creating a healthier community. I spent some time learning how I can do this through academics, but importantly, from firsthand experience. We all want to be well, to feel well, but sometimes life can present itself with situations that can really impact us like COVID-19 has so far. Although we can't always control outside forces, we can do our best to prevent infectious disease or chronic conditions in our own community. I know many people who are touched by chronic conditions, including my own family members. I recently lost one of my nearest and dearest family members, my grandmother, who was active in raising me. She inspired me to be my best self, to share love with others and do what I can to serve the community. I even founded a nonprofit because of the moral lessons that she had taught me growing up, but also because of her life's story. Tonight, I would like to honor her by sharing her story. I believe that sharing our experiences is a form of raising awareness. As a community, we have more in common than we might first think. My grandmother was an immigrant to the US. She moved here with her husband, her mother, and her four teenage children. They went through trials and triumphs like so many do. Fast forward some time and she discovered she had diabetes and hypertension. In fact, the interesting thing is I didn't know the medical terms in English. I knew them first in Farsi as Farsi was our household language. I grew up with hearing her say, I have to be careful about how much sugar I eat, but I never understood why that was the case until I grew up. I spent most of my free time with my grandmother when I was younger. She was my safe space and my guide. One day we were walking to the mall and she said she didn't feel well and she couldn't keep up with me. Her chest hurt, she had shortness of breath and she was a little bit off. The next day she had a heart attack. Luckily, she was aware of some of the symptoms, including radiating left arm pain, chest and jaw pain, and shortness of breath. She got to the hospital just in time to be treated, but thereafter, she lived with heart failure, another chronic condition. We always discussed management, treatments, preventing complication through lifestyle changes. I always watched her taking her blood glucose at home and being like, oh, that's very interesting. Can I try mine? <laughs> that's what I used to ask when I was a kid. Uh, she, made me, uh, she, she made some slight adjustments to our traditional Persian dishes. Instead of frying the eggplant, we started to bake that. Instead of frying the herbs for stews, we started to cook them with some water on the pan. We cut the amount of sugar in our traditional desserts by half and it still tasted great. We didn't want to change the authenticity of the meal, 
but we were mindful of the little modifications that we could make to, miss, to make it the best of both worlds. Sure, this did take some experimentation, not always worked out, but when we found a recipe that worked, it was great. People who live with chronic conditions, well, we live with them every day. I grew up observing how this impacted her. She was vigilant about measuring her blood glucose levels and measuring her blood pressure. I learned management from her, from seeing how she managed her own conditions so closely. I was always curious about diabetes. I thought, how can she prevent things from getting worse? My mentor recently taught me the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is 25% if your parent has it. So my mom has a 25% risk of developing it. And since my father has it as well, I also have a 25% risk of developing it. So how can I prevent my mom or even myself from developing similar conditions later in life? Let's open a discussion to think of ways to prevent the onset of chronic conditions from their progression and prevent complications from occurring. This motivated me to learn so much more. So I pursued an education in public health before pursuing osteopathic medicine. The magnitude of people touched by chronic conditions, well, it's a lot. So let's type into the chat and see how many people do you think around the world may have prediabetes? Just type in that you're, yes, too many, 30 million. That's a good guess. Definitely a lot. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Actually, 88 million people around the world are diagnosed with pre-diabetes. And I just gave away the next answer, but I was going to ask how many you thought had type two diabetes and it was 422 million people around the world are affected by type two diabetes. And according to the World Health Organization, the most common cr chronic conditions around the world are heart disease and stroke, cancer, respiratory disease, diabetes, and mental health conditions. So let's take a look at the numbers here in our own community. In Solano County, heart disease is a leading cause of death. It's even higher than the overall state values. Hospitalizations due to stroke were this, the highest specifically in South and Central Vallejo in comparison to Solano County as a whole. 10% of adults in Solano County have diabetes. COPD and asthma, the rates are so high. So how can we together as a community address this? Well, let's start at the very beginning. Please type into the chat, what does prevention mean to you? Can you please enter your uh, thoughts into the chat? Okay, let's see here. Prevention is to stop something from happening, doing what is in our control to avoid disease, not getting sick in the first place and feeling well. I see addressing an issue before it becomes a complication being proactive to address a problem before it actually is a problem. I love that. Make a plan stop. Stopping something from getting worse. Thank you all. Being nutritionally healthy and avoiding disease, eat healthy and exercise. This is great. Thank you so much. I love how we all have this idea of what prevention is and we're all on the right track. This is great. I like to um, also now open up a poll just to get an idea of have you attended any Zoom into Wellness nutrition webinars or mind, body, spirit webinars? And have you learned of the levels of prevention? Oh, well, wonderful. It's good to see a lot of you return from our nutrition webinars and mind, body, spirit webinars. Okay, I see some have not heard of the three levels of prevention and others who are not sure and others who know. Well, this is great. Thank you so much for sharing your votes. <laughs> I would, I like to think of uh, prevention as a spectrum or a road with a series of lights. There is, oh, sorry about that. Um, there is light one of uh, primary prevention there is light two, secondary prevention, and there's light three, tertiary prevention. We may go from one light to the next on our journey. 
This journey can be full of surprises, whether it's environmental, our personal choices, or choices we don't have. Wherever we are on that journey, it's not too late to take action and prevent the onset, progression, or complications of chronic conditions. So what is primary prevention? Well, public health officials have defined this as avoiding the onset of disease. So please, let's open up a discussion here. I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you think falls into this category. What do you think is included in avoiding the onset of disease? I know some had already mentioned it earlier in their definitions. It looks like we have some responses from the chat. We have being mindful with what you eat. We have listen to your body. Uh, when it's hurt, you should pay attention. Proper nutrition, minding for your lifestyle, educating yourself on risk factors. Looks like eating and exercise. Immunization is a new one that we just saw. But we have a lot of the exercise and um, eating healthy as a way to prevent this. Wow, wonderful. Excellent. Uh, we have healthy grains. Last week, we had learned about how certain foods can contribute to chronic conditions and how others can reduce inflammation during our first week from Dr. Hendricks, Dr. Stevenson, and Dr. Jones. And we have physical activity, or the word I love to use, movement. Maya Ramsey and Andrea Varias gave us excellent tips on how we can incorporate movement in our routines, even if we don't have access to the gym. Taking a moment of stretching or any other movements can do a lot of good for us. I think I saw, I heard you say someone um, said water. And that was great because water is definitely contributing to prevention. How do you think that water contributes to prevention? Does anyone have a guess? It was a great public health initiative from a long time ago to address a specific issue. Okay, well, I see hydration, excellent. Also, we have fluoride in our water to help our teeth. So speaking of teeth, dental hygiene is a form of prevention. By using dental hygiene, we can avoid cavities and inflammation. And according to the American Heart Association, inflammation caused by gum disease can lead to an increased risk of heart conditions, Alzheimer's, pneumonia, or other conditions. So oral health is very important. So what do we do when we get into a car? <laughs> Hopefully this is a safety measure that we all use. We sit, yes, and we do put seatbelts on, excellent. Another form of primary prevention. <laughs> I love this, thank you all. Now, what else is relevant for today? Masks. We not only want to protect ourselves, but we also want to protect our friends, our families, our loved ones, and our entire community by wearing masks. We also have immunizations. I heard Melody mention someone in our audience had also said immunizations earlier. That's correct. These are critical. We are asked to vaccinate babies to protect them from measles, mumps, rubella, or other preventable conditions. Right now, we're in flu season. It's important to get the flu shot. Again, not only to protect yourself, but to protect those around you from getting sick. We also see no smoking signs around, which can help prevent people from smoking and exposing others to secondhand smoke, which is attributed to the development of COPD and the exacerbation of asthma. In essence, there are so many examples of primary prevention. It may not have been readily apparent at first, but now we can see that we already take measures in primary prevention to avoid the onset of disease. Although those are very important factors, but when it really comes to it, you know, it's about balancing our mind, body, and spirit. As Paisley taught us last week, if you're stressed, take a moment to yourself. Just a moment of deep breathing to recenter and stay grounded can make a difference. As Dr. Pena and student Dr. Hyland discussed last week as well, our body communicates with our mind. So how we care for our body through what we eat, through movement, or even how we rest, how we sleep, that can 
that can impact our mental health. And in turn, our mind communicates with our spirit and that communicates with our body. They all communicate with each other. So I wanted to share more about mind, body and spirit with you. My grandmother lived a beautiful life managing diabetes for over 30 years and heart failure for over 15 years. She managed it by spending time with loved ones and optimizing her spirit. She did the things she enjoyed, such as cooking and gardening. Gardening and cooking in itself are forms of physical activity and movement. She optimized her mind by doing puzzles and knitting and sharing stories of our family's history. She taught me how to knit and you sure do need to think about the numbers and styles of stitches. And here's something she was knitting for me. I love that I know how to do that. I feel like when you use your hands and you apply it to something and you make something out of it, it's very rewarding in itself. Those years were the years that I learned my passion for optimizing mind, body, and spirit so that we can live as beautiful a life as possible. I also learned that I had a passion for gardening and knitting and cooking. So after she left, someone wise told me that continuing to do the things that she loved or the things that she taught me would be a beautiful way to pay tribute to her. That's why I'm here tonight, to raise awareness about chronic conditions and how we can prevent them from starting and progressing, and especially to avoid complications. Now, what resources are offered to address these levels? Have, I'm gonna open up another poll for you to see if you have heard of these various resources um, in just a moment. Now, what resources are offered at these levels? Like, have you heard of National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is also known as DPP? You can type into the chat yes or no. Excellent, thank you. Oh, that's great, wow. I'm seeing a lot of yeses here, wonderful. Well, to learn more about DPP, you can visit our website. Um, I will post that into chat in just a little bit. And you, um, and you can also watch an incredible candid conversation with Maya Ramsey and Roberta Flannel. Ms. Flannel shares her story about her experience with diabetes and how DPP was life-changing and empowering. So what is it? It's a lifestyle prevention program that has coaches making it easier for people at risk for type 2 diabetes to participate in lifestyle change and reduce their risk of type 2 diabetes. In addition, Torrey University of California is also providing access to a mobile flu clinic. You can find more information at the site that has been posted into the chat. And these resources are offered throughout November, um, November 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. So let's continue on to the journey and uh, go to the next stoplight, level two. So what is secondary prevention all about? Well, it's defined as early disease detection. And if a condition is detected or diagnosed, well, we can make something, um, we can, I'm sorry, this would make it possible to prevent the worsening of the chronic condition and, by, uh, and the emergence of symptoms by addressing the condition through treatment and lifestyle changes or to minimize complications before the condition becomes severe. So how could we know that we're at risk? I gave an example earlier that one of my parents has type two diabetes. So I have a 25% risk of developing the condition as well. So what I do is I get screened. I get yearly lab work done to measure my blood glucose levels. Other examples of screening include blood pressure readings, labs that look at other conditions, and even a dental visit to screen for gingivitis or gum disease. So I'm going to open up this poll, see what your thoughts are. Do you have access to screening resources? Have you heard of Mobec and have you attended Mobec before? To get screened. seeing a lot of great that we all have uh, access to screening resources some who say that they're not sure if you're not sure please feel free to type into the chat if you'd like clarification um, or more resources because I do have a list that we will be providing on our website of resources throughout Solano County that do offer screening and other resources for healthcare. Thank you all for sharing. Let's see, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, 
Now I'd like to introduce you to Mobeck. This incredible, this incredible community resource travels around Solano County. Tour University staff and health professional students engage one-on-one -on -one with community members who visit the education center, assist, assess risk factors for diabetes, providing diabetes screening, both blood glucose screenings and A1C screenings for high risk patients and also provide personalized education to prevent diabetes and prediabetes. Services also include blood pressure screenings and checkups. We also provide counseling regarding lifestyle health modifications, nutrition, medication, and exercise education. We will provide this PDF on our website after the webinar is over. And do you have any questions that you'd like to type into the chat for us? There's also a separate Q&A function in case you want to uh, send us a question while Shalaya is speaking. Okay. Level three, the next stoplight. We've reached the tertiary prevention level. This level is defined as reducing the negative impact of an already established condition by restoring function and reducing complications. At this level, we're trying to optimize our life and for our existing conditions and improve our overall well being. Say someone is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, we can encourage lifestyle modifications such as movement and nutritious foods. We also need to be aware of medication management. By doing this, we will hopefully manage our condition and be able to prevent complications such as chronic kidney disease or cardiovascular disease. Say someone has hypertension, managing their blood pressure through first listening to their provider's recommendations, which may include medication management, exercise, nutritious diet can all be used together to prevent complications from occurring. Essentially at this point, there's a diagnosis and that's okay. It's not the end of the line. We can live long and healthy lives by managing the condition. Our goal at this stage is to improve our quality of life. I've shared my story of my beloved grandmother who was touched by different conditions. So I'd like to hear more about your experiences through the poll. Please don't feel obligated to share personal information. This is a safe space and we're here for learning and growth. Your names will not be announced in the recording. I'm going to open up this poll for you. Are you dealing with at least one chronic condition? Or do you know someone who does live with a chronic condition? Let's see, majority says yes. Not sure, more than one. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. No, there's a program in uh, Vallejo that can help those who have chronic conditions and are hospitalized in the past year. Um, and sorry about this. Um, and they help people with diabetes or chronic kidney conditions or uh, chronic kidney disease or other conditions. And um, the resources here, they're really incredible. And I'm really, um, grateful to be working with such an incredible team at Toro for providing these resources to our community. Even if you do have a chronic condition, it doesn't mean you will get the worst case scenario. There's a lot that can be done to prevent complications. So I'd like to introduce tonight, Dr. Clipper Young and Dr. Dia Manavellan, who will teach us about Farm to Home, an incredible program that will bring hope, support, and community to the homes of those touched by chronic conditions. So um, thank you, Shalea, and also thank you, Dr. Shubrook, for giving us an opportunity to share the work that we have been doing this past year, trying to develop this program. So Farm to Home, so what is Farm to Home? So in the nutshell, it's a uh, chronic disease management and also lifestyle uh, a behavioral change um, program coming together. And um, why is it farm? So farm stands for pharmacy. So we are trying to target, in, uh, we're trying to target a very specific population first for those who have been in the hospital due to exacerbation of certain chronic condition. So because those are the, the people who are at high risk 
and then going back to the hospital. So we want to uh, stop that from happening, which is an example uh, for tertiary prevention. Uh, next slide, please. So for now, um, for now we have two people. So myself and also Dr. Manavalen. And by training, we both are from D, and we are we both are Toro grad, and with the help from the Dream Team, so the diabetes team on campus. Next slide, please. So um, also something I forgot to mention. So this program is fully sponsored by um, Sutter and they asked a question. So, and from a observation that many people using emergency room are also being hospitalized due to preventable um, condition, due to preventable, um, I guess, condition or something that we can do in the community. And they reach out because of the MOBAC um, program that we're doing on campus. And they reach out asking, asking the question. So can, can pharmacists do something to help prevent um, or reduce the cost of healthcare, and which is the question that the healthcare sector is facing. So with that question in mind from Sutter, then we slowly thinking about how can we address that to, um, to reduce the cost of um, healthcare. So that would be the overall theme or the mission of this, of this program, and which is stated on the right of this slide. But in order to address that, this is a very broad statement. So in order to address this, and we ask ourselves, okay, what are the different components in healthcare that we can um, tap into and create some kind of intervention to help with that? So we came up with three components. So I mentioned earlier, um, this is a chronic disease management program. So of course the clinical uh, component has to be there for chronic disease management. And also a lot of, uh, time that patients spend at home and dealing with this chronic conditions by themselves. So then we thought, well, the education has to be there in order for them to, um, to manage the condition. And also, and, and the last component, it's actually my passion and being a clinic clinician, it's well, even though they have the knowledge and they, they taking the medication, but what if they're psychologically, they're just not there or not having the motivation and, and that means it's very difficult for patients to, to deal with this 24 uh, seven issue in their life, right? So then we thought, well, then, it's, then we need to, to do some intervention to help improve their perceived quality of life um, in a sense to increase their, their um, sense of well being as well as their uh, confidence to manage their condition. Um, so, and if we can achieve all three components together then that would be the heart and soul of farm to home. And because we want to help drive some of those behavioral changes. Next slide, please. And so, and there are a lot of medical conditions out there. So, and after talking to Sutter and they identify um, six conditions that, that we can focus on first. And going back to the slide that uh, Shalea um, shared in the beginning, those are the reasons why the six conditions are, um, are selected to be the focus of farm to home. So type two diabetes, so we're the diabetes team. So that would be one of the conditions that we focus on. And having type two diabetes and not being, uh, uh, not controlling it well enough. And that can lead to other conditions. For example, kidney condition or heart failure, right? And also having high blood pressure or hypertension put people at a higher risk of having type two diabetes. So we also want to manage that as well. And of the two other conditions has to do with a uh, respiratory system. So that would be asthma and COPD. And with this six med medical conditions, then that would be the focus of um, farm to home. So now I would uh, pass this on to Dr. Manavalen to talk about more details about uh, farm to home and what we are planning to do um, to help our patients. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for that wonderful overview. And also, um, Dr. Shubrook and Shalaya, thank you for having us over here this evening. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, who is eligible to be enrolled into Farm to Home? We are targeting patients who are severely ill 
and um, and it would be patients who have those chronic conditions Dr. Young mentioned earlier. So in order to be eligible to be enrolled into the program, uh, the participant should have diabetes and heart failure plus two of the other conditions or diabetes or heart failure and three of the other conditions. And anyone who is over the age of 50 would be given priority for enrollment. And regardless of gender or ethnicity, um, they can be enrolled into the program. And for now, we are focusing on uh, Solana County residents living in uh, the zip codes of 94590 or 94589. And also just want to note that uh, patients who have diabetes with a history of heart attacks or strokes or A1C of um, greater than 10% would be considered priority patients. Next slide, please. So this is in a nutshell, the process of our intervention. This is what we would do if we have a participant in the program. So one thing that's not mentioned here is we would follow every participant for a period of four to six months. And the four to six months would vary depending on the complexity of the patient itself. So we will have an initial home visit, which is followed by um, follow-up home visits or follow-up telephone encounters spanned over a period of four to six months. So the initial home visit would be a very comprehensive visit and that would um, range from an hour to two because that is when we would want to interview the patient thoroughly, get all the information about their medical history, all the medications that they are on, and we also want to see if they are on appropriate medications for the um, for the disease state. And we also want to assess like, you know, do the patients have any barriers? Do they have any problems at accessing their medications. And we also wanna discuss what the goals are for that patient. So following the initial home visit, we will have another home visit. And during that, we, we're gonna look at, you know, the outcomes um, because, of the because of the changes that we made at the initial visit. And then we will also be um, gauging the necessity for education for the patient and we will revisit the goals and barriers. We will also offer immunization services uh, as part of Farm to Home. And the follow-up home visits will be followed by telephone encounters or home visits as appropriate for the patient. And during the phone encounters, we'll check in and see how the patient is doing. We'll revisit what the barriers are, if there are any, and we'll go over all the education that's needed. And if there's any medication refills that are needed for the patient, we'll take care of that as well. Next slide, please. So as part of Farm to Home, we will offer a variety of immunization services. And um, the ones that we have here are influenza, hepatitis B, the pneumococcal shingle, and Tdap vaccines. So these are the ones that are recommended for patients with that particular, with the disease states that we mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So I also want to briefly go over how does this benefit the participant, right? So as part of Farm to Home, we do want to educate the patient. So we want them to have a better understanding of their disease state and also their medication usage. Why are they using it? Why is it necessary to use the medications as directed? We also want every participant to have an improved self-efficacy to manage their own conditions. Even once we are out of the picture after the four to six months, we want to be sure that they can manage their condition. We also want to make sure the medications are appropriate. And if, if possible, we would like to make it simpler when appropriate. We also hope that Farm to Home will uh, improve the self-perceived quality of life in every participant. Next slide, please. And how does the Farm to Home program benefit the community as a whole? So with Farm to Home, 
eventually, we hope to see there is a reduction in the health care costs that are associated with increased hospitalizations or increased doctor's office visits and even ER visits. And Farm to Home, we want to improve or um, coordinate better care between patients and their primary care providers. Also, ultimately, we want to improve the quality of health care for Vallejo residents. Next slide. So we do have a website. If you have uh, more questions, there are also some resources that, uh, that are free that you can access online. And the website is www.fantehome.org. And you can either contact Dr. Yang or I if you have any questions. So before I end the farm to home uh, component of this presentation, I would like to just remind everyone what uh, Dr. Shubrook mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, and that is, it is never too late for prevention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Young and Dr. Manavellan. Um, this Farm to Home initiative is so incredible. And I'd like to open up uh, the opportunity for any of our participants here to share their thoughts, um, to ask any questions in the Q&A tab, or to provide any comments for us tonight. Malaya, we have a question from the chat from a little earlier. The question is, what is diabetes prevention training? That's an excellent question. The Diabetes Prevention Program is a CDC program that is offered for anyone who has pre-diabetes uh, pre and is at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. And there is a specific certification program that Tori University is offering where you can come in to be trained as a certified lifestyle health coach. And after that, you can also uh, become trained as a master trainer in which you will train lifestyle health coaches. More information on this can be found on the CDC website, which I will include in the chat function in just a moment. And also at our website at the tu.edu slash Mobec, you will find more about DPP, about Mobec, and DEEP, another diabetes empowerment program. Okay. Shalaya, we have another question from the chat. The question is, how will my primary care provider know your recommendations? Would you like to take this? Sure. So um, we will be working with your primary care doctor. So for now, we are working to have relationship with uh, doctors at Vallejo Family Health Services. So we we once we establish that, anytime we meet with you or anytime we meet with the participant, we will be sending a note to your primary care doctor about any of the medication, of any changes that we've made to your medications or any tests that we've ordered or anything like that. Thank you so much. We have another question in the chat. I will open it to any of our panelists. The question is, what is the data from Solano County in regards to ER visits weekly or on a monthly basis, so on and so forth? So Mario, thank you for the, the question. I do not have an answer to that because um, it really depends on the location and also depends on the hospital. So I'm more than happy to look into it and get back to you. Thank you so much, everyone. I, um, I would like to share a few more things before we wrap up our uh, webinar for today. I'd like to share that, yes, we can incorporate various prevention techniques into our lives, but there's also one thing that I feel very passionate about, 
and I feel it's very important to share before we end our conversation this evening. That is, Torrey University of California has a patient advocacy club. We work together, into, it's an interdisciplinary club in which we work together and analyze how to best answer a list of about 30 standard medical interview questions. This includes your medication list, allergy list, and also how you're doing with a chronic condition or a new medical problem. Answering forms in a waiting room is nothing new, but we can help you answer these questions in the comfort of your own home, at your own pace, and potentially with the help of a family member, friend, or caregiver. You can access our forms, paper or digital, at prehistory.com. And I will include this in our chat here. Um, so why is this important, you may ask? Well, say your doctor gives you medications that what I found. may create, um, sorry, Siri looks like she has something to say. Um, say your doctor gives you medications that will create side effects. Well, what if you went to another doctor and they didn't prescribe, they, and they prescribed the same medication, but they didn't have that information? Or what if someone went to the hospital and was discharged and asked to follow up with their provider? What if their char charting system may not be the same? There may be a lack of communication. I know for our family, this presented as a challenge because our primary family language is Farsi, not English. So having my grandma go from doctor to doctor saying she needs this or that, let's just say things really did get lost in translation. That's why I felt I needed to be her advocate, but I also hope for her to be able to advocate for herself. Like Dr. Manavellan said, self-efficacy and empowerment is very important when it comes to your healthcare. Using a prehistory form can empower you to keep track of your own health history. And that in itself can prevent other conditions or, or other complications from occurring. In addition, I'd like to discuss what can you do if you're diagnosed? There's a, an abundance of information out there, infinite unofficial medical advice on the internet. So what's the best way to approach all of it? Well, First, get advice from your healthcare provider and their team, but also support groups. Get together with others who are going through something similar. Our very own Solano Diabetes Advisory Forum, also known as SODA, has created a support group. I have entered the, um, I, I mean, we're going to enter the link for the interest form into the chat and their, their sessions start tonight. It's quite exciting. If you or anyone you know would like to join, you can sign up to share your story, to learn from others, and to create community. During one of our webinars last, last week, Paisley Rosengren discussed, when it comes to stress management, creating community is one of the most fundamental ways to change our stress and relate to others. We're not alone in our journeys. We are all a community and having additional support groups and communities can help us grow together. And I wanted to say thank you all for coming tonight. I hope this conversation was not only informative, but empowering and shed light upon the fact that we are here as a community to support each other. And if we do have a chronic condition, management is key. And Toro University of California has the resources to help you at every level of prevention. You know, we've all been through so much in the past several months through pandemic. And I know a lot of us have lost loved ones. So I'd like to actually honor them tonight through this conversation that we're having together. And I hope that you are able to take away the importance of prevention and also come together as a community. If you ever need to please reach out. Tomorrow we're going to be discussing the impact that chronic conditions have on mental health and how mental health can influence chronic conditions. And we're going to be posting resources so you can have access to the resources that you need for screening, for health groups, uh, um, health uh, care facilities that hopefully can be accessible to you. And hopefully you'll see Mobeck around. Come get your flu shot. It's really important. I wanted to say again, thank you for coming and zooming into wellness with us. Take care, everyone. Before we end the session tonight, we have two more questions to open up to the panelists if now's a good time. Absolutely. We have two similar questions right now. I just want to confirm this farm to home program. Is it only for Solano County? Um, can other counties access um, the services here in Solano County? So first, as of now, the plan is to only focus on Vallejo residents. And even to be more specific, it's the two zip codes that Dr. Manavillian talked about, um, 945, 
eight, nine, and nine zero. Those are the the focus at this point. Uh, the reason behind it is just because um, one, it's Sutter request that we focus on South Vallejo, which is those two zip codes. But we do have a plan to slowly at least cover the entire Vallejo. And then if this program um, that we have data to support the success of this program, and then I would imagine that we can slowly uh, branch that out to the entire Solano County. Um, the, the other question was about for those who are outside of Solano County and we don't um, have the services for those outside of Solano at this point. And thanks for the questions. I wanna thank everyone tonight. I think that as you can see, we have a lot of expertise. We are so uh, glad that uh, you all could join us tonight. Shalaya, Dr. Young, Dr. Manavellan, Melody. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being so interactive. As you remember, and you've heard very nicely from Shalaya, we've talked about nutrition and healthy eating. We've talked about mind, body, spirit, and movement. This week, we've talked about stigma as it relates to chronic disease, and it's never too late to prevent uh, complications or progression of disease. And I don't know about you, but this year has challenged my mental health more than any other year in my adult life. And tomorrow night, we will be talking about mental health and chronic disease and how you can thrive and, and take care of both things because of course, mental health is, is intimately related with physical health and disease. And so our Kirby Brooks from Solano County Public Health will be leading us through a discussion of mental health and chronic disease. And then of course, just to highlight next week, you'll get to hear from Ann Lee, um, who's uh, one of our MOBIC leaders who will help us with uh, being healthy in the holidays. We don't have to just give in and be unhealthy. And then Shalaya will close us out with a how to stay, um, how to launch forward with the summation of all the things and, and just really you know, doing all the things we can to take care of ourselves. So we wanna thank you again tonight.